Well, it looks like people were a little late in joining, so we'll wait for a few minutes to see if anyone else shows up before I get started. I'm like these, I wish I knew some good jokes, but I don't. So I'll spare you. Now let's get started. Um, hopefully, more people will join. Um, in part, because I'm going to talk about something that you want to know for assignment three. So it'd be nice if there are more people and they can, can then ask questions. So I've been talking about networking, and last time I talked about how to use Volley. Um, I'll briefly go over um, a bit more about that using how to do posts, and then get a few other topics to look at. So let me Change the screen. There we go. Okay. Um, so I'm looking at document fifteen. Um, and so the one last thing I haven't talked about is. How do we actually post things? Oh, by post, I mean um, I want to send data from the phone to the server. And so we do have a post. And so we need to put data in the request and send it off the server. Um, and to do this, um, when we look at a JSON object request, um, when we create one, there's several things. One is, of course, the URL to the server. Um, we're also seeing response listener. Um, so that's what, what gets run when the answer comes back, right? And there's also a response error listener. So when there's an error, that's what gets called. But there's a, the third thing we can pa pass in our JSON request up. object request is a JSON object. Um, if that doesn't exist, then what we do is we, um, the system then sends a get request to the server. And otherwise, if it does, object does exist, it turn into a post, which is what we want. So to do a post, I'm going to send data to the server and request um, a create a JSON object. Uh, I put some data in it. Um, 
<clears throat> now I need my listener. Again, since I'm just showing you how to do this, send it up to server. I'm just on the response, I'm just saying I got the response back. Then I need my failure. Um, um, I to change the slide, but I need the URL. Now I create my JSON request object and give it the URL, the data object, and the two listeners. And then I add to my volley queue. Um, and I meant to change this because I had a special class to um, hide the two lines, but you've seen those two lines before, right? So we just basically want to create the request queue and then add the request to it. So this syntax is not going to work for you. So I'll just make that clear by doing this and leave it like that. And that's it. That's all we need to post data to the server. Um, yeah, I found that when you get in errors, the two string method doesn't give as much information. Um, the data object gains the server response and you get the status code. Um, so I'm intending to, you know, when you get an error message, ask for the data to get the response from the server. Right. Um, any questions? Hmm. I didn't think so. You'll probably have questions when I give you the assignment for. Another um, unrelated topic. If you create um, files in your application um, or you have a database and you look at the file, um, how can you see it on the device or on the emulator? The problem is Something goes wrong, maybe you didn't write it right correctly, maybe you read it wrong, maybe the file doesn't exist. Um, so in Android Studio, in that lower right hand corner, there's device file explorer. Um, so here we've got a sample program and I uh, this, you know, I just create open a file called create a file called foo.txt and then I write bar to it. That's it. So this is a program to write a file so we can see it how to how to find it in the in this video. Um, so yeah, you run the program, open the device file explorer. Um, and then you have to go into data data and find your program directory and then right, right click on the program directory, synchronize it, and open open the directory and open the file. So there's a program in in our studio. And I'm going to go to device manager, there's data, now another data. And now I need to go find my program. And so you have to go past all the Google stuff. Oh, there it is, right? Um, make it a bigger so I can actually, and there it is, there's, my program and synchronize 
So I get the view from the, you know, the file directory into the file, there's foo.txt. Um, and now I can just say open. There it is, bar. Well, it's fairly, once you know it's there, it's pretty easy. It's just that if you don't know it's there, then, and then this on the Mac, you can then go find it on your hard drive, which you can't do if you do not device. And then you can actually see the entire tail. And then I can delete it so I can run it again. See the trade. Okay. Like I said, it's pretty straightforward once you know it's there. And once you realize you have to go to the data data directory to find and then find your application. Um, Okay, now we get to the point part where we actually want to, well, for assignment three, we want to look at the various sensors we can get on a device and how to get acceleration out of it. Um, now you'll notice, so here is the official list I went to Google uh, site yesterday. Uh, I'll take the list. And so here is all the possible types of sensors they claim that can be on a device. So not all devices will have all the sensors. Um, and they say usually a phone is going to have an accelerometer and at least an ignometer. Um, ladder to, to know what, what it's north and south. Um, So what device, what's, how do we know what centers are on the device? Well, we can ask it. Um, again, a very simple program. The first part is right, get, given the service manager. So it's just system service, contact service, sensor service, and then we have to cast it as a sensor manager. And then this was basically, right, Get sensor list, and then what type of sensors do we want? And here I'm asking for all of them. And then I just I'll put put the answer. And I ran this both on the actual device and I ran it on a, a simulator. Um, and so for each sensor, you get a fair amount of information. Um, I deleted most of it so we can see the entire list, um, but here it is, right? Some sort of model number, kilometer, who made it, the version, the type, maximum range, resolution, power, right? minimum delay. Um, and then again, the gyroscope, magnometer, pressure, temperature, proximity sensor, light sensor, orientation, um, step detector, but notice um, it's uh, the same as our accelerometer. So basically, they're using accelerometer to detect steps. So, um, in motion, gravity, accel in accelerator, rotations, right? Um, Pick up gesture, game location gesture, right? Um, double touch, double tap. I mean, first thing that struck me is um, 
This is a list we said we have, um, but when we actually, now back here, there are many more different types of sensors indicating on it, if it's a one. Emulator when ran it, the list was shorter. Um, and you'll notice that they all, most of them start with goldfish. So basically doing this in software. Um, and so there is an accelerometer we can use, which is good. So the question is, how can we actually use it? Um, since clearly the emulator does not have an accelerometer actual sensor on it because it's just a software. Um, if you want to use right the sensor, then you have to add it to the manifest file. That's just why you use that sensor. Otherwise, it's going to try and use it, it won't work. Well, if you require it, I'm sorry, going to require it. If the application really, really needs it, um, if you send, say, required, and when someone goes to the app store, we you to, to look for applications, if their device doesn't have this sensor, they won't see it. So this is use, you don't need the permission, it's just, here's what you're going to use so people know can only see applications which actually work on the device. Now, recommendations are, if it's actually essential for your application, then we, we say um, required true. But it's just one of the features that they might want to use, um, then you may want to have a workaround for that particular feature so that you get a larger audience, not say you need a accelerometer. Or any type of sensor you're looking for. Number of the sensors, accelerometer, gravity, gyroscope, um, give us values in three dimensions. Um, well, the X is common, Y is common, and then Z is coming out of the phone. That's the positive X goes from left to right, Y goes up, and then Z comes out of the screen. When we have a pro program that's getting your sensor values, um, you'll get a sensor event, and all these sensors are going to give you three values, one for X coordinate, one for Y coordinate, one for Z coordinate. And the X coordinate is always the first one, so it's value zero, value one, Y, and value two, Z. And for those of you who remember your physics, um, acceleration is measured in meters per second squared. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Okay, so far so good. Okay, let's see, oh, I forgot, I forgot. I forgot that in the chat window in case someone wants to type it in. All this typing. Interesting things for us to talk. Um, so now, how do we actually get the sensor values out? Um, 
Again, we need the sensor manager. And Nikon was rather interesting. Some of the examples we give, right, Aminyan creates, and we have two properties, one for the sensor manager, and they do a late init. So it doesn't have to be have that optional or nullable option. And so here they set the sensor manager. Now, sometimes when they um, do samples, they will then say, well, let's check to see if my accelerometer sensor property is null. If it's null, then um, go get it, all right? Um, and I then check to make sure that the sensor is there, and then I get the default sensor and assign the sensor other than no. Other times when they give examples, Google gives examples, they they skip this statement and say, look, I'm in you're in the on create method. So how can uh, that sensor property not be known. Um, I have no idea. Um, but that's interesting. Some of the programmers do it and some don't. So now I have my accelerometer sensor. Um, Now, whenever you go in the background, um, you don't want this, you don't want that sensor sending your your application data because it consumes battery power, and you don't want to do that. Particularly if you go in the background and the user never brings it to the foreground, then your program for days could be running that sensor and really running the battery down and users do not like that. So what I do on the Zoom is I need to register a listener to get the values for that sensor and I'm just going to use the current activity um, and then I give it the sensor I'm looking for and how often I want the updates. Right, going on pause, then I need to unregister so I'm not getting the points anymore. To get the events, if we go back to previous video, um, um, I need to implement the sensor event listener. And that listener has two methods. Um, one is on accuracy change. Uh, the accuracy on the, on the accelerometer is not going to change. Um, but if you're looking for a location, it will because there are three different ways in which the cell phones get to location. One, of course, is by talking to the GPS. Um, but the GPS antennas you use only two on the phone, and you need three good um, antennas, and then you be in different dimensions. And so the problem is the phone phones are too flat, right? So they're good three dimension antenna. So they only give you two dimensions. Um, if you're not quite exactly, if you're not getting the three or more satellites, you need to get a good reading. So that's one way. And then what they do is it will then look at the signal strength of different cell towers. Um, and since we know they know where all cell towers are, the relative signal strength um, between them is going to dictate, give you an idea of where you are relative to those cell towers. And then um, they also do it by looking at um, Wi Fi base stations and relative strength from there. So that takes the latter to take more time, and so it starts 
the actors have changed as they get more and more better. That's not true of the photometer. Um, and then the other method is on um, it's a change. So this is um, every time you saw, well, based upon how fast you would say you wanted it, you'll get a new sensor event. And now that sensor event, I'm looking at the X value, not the Y value, and the Z value. So that's how we get the um, sensor change, we get the sensor data. And as it changes, is updated. And well, it's going to give you just a certain rate, even if the phone is sitting flat on the desk. Um, and so here's the good output I was getting um, on the emulator. And I deleted lots of lines because otherwise you can only you know, you're getting a stream of events. So you can see what happens. And so here is the emulator in its normal state in the portrait mode. Um, so most of the gravitation gravity was in the y dimension, which you expect. Um, but there's a little of that over into the z axis. Um, don't know why. I then rotated it. Um, so it was in landscape mode. And then right, most of it was in the x axis. And since I rotated it, um, I guess to the left is negative. And you see the values are zero, but there was even just a little bit over into Y. I rotated it back, and now both X and Z are zero, and the Y had all of it. Um, and then when I moved the, moved the phone, um, right now we're getting, we're getting different values. How fast do not get dates? Um, there's various um, delays. This is a slow. And this is supposed to fastest um, for assignment three. You know, basically a game you say you want that amount updates. Although I was in normal and they were streaming pretty fast. And uh, so, um, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can be talking to put any further for the later. Um, now, for assignment three, I asked you just to gravity, right? Um, so the nice thing about phone is there is a sensor type gravity, um, and it does run on the emulator. Um, so instead of getting, um, if I you shake the phone, right? Like with the acceleration due to gravity plus acceleration due to your shaking. Um, if we do this, um, with this gravity, we're just getting the effect of gravity. Um, so we can use the um, default with gravity. 
And now we have some fun things to do. Um, and that is, um, well, the goal assignment three is, so we want gravity to be able to take our lines and, and pull them down, right? And if we then rotate the device, so the gravity will change in different locations. And so if I start with a device right like this, and you know, then the line's falling down, but if I can rotate it, just fall aside, and then I can put it down, I should go to, you know, and so I should be able to uh, continually rotate the device, you know, have some effect on where the lines are going. And so we need to take that acceleration and change it to velocity, and then use that velocity to predict so we can actually move the lines. So we really want um, compute, you know, given a line at time t, where does it belong, right? Its location. Um, so if we let L of T be location of a line or point at a given time, and V of T be the velocity at a given time, um, and acceleration at a given time, um, we can then compute location and we can make certain assumptions. Um, the acceleration data is coming quite quite fast, and so the time interval between one and the other is very very short. So we can approximate. We know that the acceleration may be changing over time, but if we had a small time interval, the change is going to be pretty small. We can assume acceleration will be constant over time. Um, and once acceleration becomes constant over time, continuous velocity becomes straightforward. Um, so if I know the velocity at a given time, I know the acceleration um, at the next time it will, again, since the time is so, so, so short, right, I, we can assume that acceleration is constant over time and then multiply that, that short length of time that gives us a new velocity at the next time step. And so literally what we'll do is, and every time we get a new sensor event, we're going to then update the location of a, a point or a line by computing right, the new velocity for that particular um, point or line. And once I get the velocity, I can then do the same trick um, with location. So again, we, since the time interval is so, so short, we can assume the velocity is going to be constant over time. And again, it's approximation, but you know, since we're talking about this edgy really time frame, that you know, that approximation is good enough. And so then we get to come to where it was the, at time t, and then the velocity at time t plus one times how long that time interval was, and that gives us a new location. And then we can right, rewrite this equation, combine the two to get this one. So far, so good. If anyone is has panicked yet. No one's typing the message seriously. No one has raised their hand. They're probably all watching Netflix on the side. Right? Every once in a while you cancel the screen and see what I'm talking about. But this you do want to pay attention to because you need to use it in assignment three. Now the problem is, what do we do with this time, uh, delta times, right? Um, talk about that. Um, I want to talk about scales. Um, again, if you 
remember your physics, all those physics problems that I had to do in high school, and I assume they still do the same sort of physics someplace. When you do physics, right, your salaries have to be careful for your units. When you've got equations, you have to make sure when you multiply things, you look at the units and some cancel out, and, right? Um, acceleration is in, like I said, meters per second squared. And the problem is um, phones are usually, I mean, for you know, six inches is a pretty big phone. And if we have an acceleration of nine meters per second squared, um, it's going to not take very long. Well, you probably won't even see it. It'll start off and almost instantly be gone. So we're going to have to deal with the fact that, oh, maybe I want the phone program to simulate that line falling for, say, 10 meters. So we have to map 10 meters onto the size of the screen. Now, there's two ways we can do that. One is to be very precise and say, OK, how many pixels are there? Say there's 2,500 pixels. And we want 2,500 pixels to represent 10 meters. So how many pixels per represent a single meter? Um, and start doing this calculation to be OK. Um, so every time acceleration is 9 meters per second squared. And, you know, a 9 meter velocity is going to be some pixels. Um, the other way I can do it is just sort of fake it. Um, by that, what I mean is we can start adding you know, T plus A V T plus not a single day of not a plus I and then C times A of T plus one. And then we can assume since we're sort of ignoring units, we can assume that time delta time is one time unit, so it goes away. Um, and then we can now look at what should B be, what should C be, to get a reasonable simulation of the line should start falling slowly and, and gradually increase. Make sense? Let's see, no one is saying anything. Um, so let's see. Is anyone listening? If you are, say yes. Yes, we're preserved. Okay, so I got one yes by the button. Uh, one person said yes. So, and two people did text yes. You know, doing this remotely um, makes you wonder how radio announcers feel. Um, they're talking to microphones like, am I listening or not? Uh, professor? Yeah. I'm sorry about uh, about asking again. Like, I mean, if you can explain one more time uh, LVA, this calculation. <laughs> this, is, this is something like I'm not able to understand. Okay. 
Okay. Um, so again, let's assume I'm just looking at a point, right? This is my point. Um, this is location. And initially it starts off stationary, so its velocity is zero. But let's say, um, okay, so let's start velocity. So V of zero is zero. Um, and this will say the acceleration um, at time one is equal to two, right? Um, another question is, and this, let's say it's acceleration in the y dimension. So where is this point? Where is here is L of zero. Where is L of one going to be? Um, well, L of one is going to be, we're going to have to take right, L of zero, plus we have to know which direction it's going. So V of zero is zero, plus some V and C times acceleration of one, which is two, this becomes L of zero plus B well, times zero plus C times two, which is equal to just L of zero plus two C, right? And so we'll want to play with C to see which makes simulation seem reasonable. Let's say three makes it reasonable. So then, um, let's, um, you know, then that means that we get plus six. Um, and then we may, we'll move down six pixels down here. Right? that help? Yes, Professor. Thank you. Now, we also have to do this um, in two dimensions, right? So we have to worry about acceleration on the X dimension, the Y dimension. Um, in assignment three, we're not interested in trying to do perspective and getting, making it smaller or larger based on the z-axis. That becomes a much more difficult calculation. Okay. And now, let me see, I want to, uh, answer a question no one has asked yet. So let me be shy. So let me change the screen. Um, can everyone now see the emulator? Yes. Now yeah, we'll see. Do you see the um, little side window on the emulator? Uh, no, it is showing only half. Yeah. Would you see half of the half of the window? Yeah. On the very bottom, the three dots. Mm, no. The very bottom icon on that sidebar on is. Um, when you click on it, it pops up a window. And let me see if I can now. In the new window, can I actually see it? Oh, okay. Um,
Here is, now you can see that this is the little window next to the emulator. And the bottom one with three dots, you can see that. And when you click on that, you get another pop up window. And I need to share. And yes. Yes. And this is the window that you see. Um, and the various things you can do. And what we're interested in is the virtual sensors. All right, and when we do this, there is accelerometer selected for you. Um, and then um, we can do various things. We can say, just do device rotation like that. And it's then going to change um, right, the values of accelerometer and if we change it back, again, they change differently. And if your program is um, getting a sensor events, that will happen. It will get those changes. We can also move the device by clicking on move, and then right, we can right, move it in the X dimension. We can move it in the Y dimension, in the Z dimension, right, move it back and forth. Um, but we're only interested in X and Y. Um, and I'm not sure why when I click on move it, it changed to um, non skip mode. That's how you can test your program on your emulator on your computer as opposed to having your phone. Any questions? Okay. Let me need to. I'm having a number of problems with my Android Studio. And one is that my emulator randomly quits. And now I need um, But quick, and that window is open. And now let me see. Controls. Oh, there's the controls. Okay, now I can go back to. There we go. Back to my slides. Um, is anyone else having a problem with the emulator um, randomly quit on them? I'm guessing that's all my controls. There's my that window. So some of you are getting um, no, that's so no one's having a problem yet. I'll do the standard reboot my machine, see if that fixes it. If it doesn't fix it, I'll reinstall Android Studio and then later. Like what this. Um, I want to talk about gestures. Um, I've all warned you, you really don't want to use gestures on assignment three. So you should know about them. And there's always these standard gestures that 
we all know from songs, right? I just changed the size of the slide. Did it change the size that you saw on my slides? Yeah. Um, now there's touch, there's tap, there's long touch, zoom, print, slide, double tap, first matter. Um, um, and it's, we're going to do this by hand, it gets complicated because you look at swipe, and that clearly is swipe, and what's this? Is it swipe left or right? Or the, um, so the gestures will, will do it, figure this out for you. Um, and it recognizes, the system recognizes the standard gestures. Um, you can create new gestures. The problem with doing that is you have to then train the users to uh, know what those gestures are. Um, early on, I, you know, I had some programs that I downloaded which did that, you know, some interesting way that actually um, you know, doing a, a calculator by just using gestures and it was very interesting the first time that I can never remember the gestures because they're non-standard. Um, uh, at some point, I was pretty even that I could never remember what the gestures are, and it was easy enough. And that's a problem with creating your own gestures for your application that's an on standard is you just have to know it and remember them, and that can happen. Um, you have to use your application a lot, but I think pretty, you know, pretty good one. Um, Here's the standard gestures. It's just you have to get the touch events, which we've seen before. Um, pass those touch events on to the detector. Um, and so there's a, a listener that we're going to call those methods to tell you what type of gesture there was. And a third. Um, there's a bunch of different types of gestures, listeners, like right? here's a definite listener. There are things they will listen to. There's a double tap listener. Um, you know, a, a simple listener that does combines a bunch. Um, and there, there's a pinch gesture recommend detector. Um, and listen for that. Um, Right, so there's, there's different classes, different interfaces, right? Um, there's a simple example. I'm looking for the gesture events. And then my activity is um, implementing the gesture on gesture listener. Um, and again, I'm and a property for um, gesture detector compatibility library. Um, and so I instantiate that and give it a, a current context, which is again just activity and who I want this to be with the activity. They don't have to be the same. Um, and then here are the various events um, on touch event. So my touch event, I want to pass on um, pass on to my detector, and I do that as a land expression saying. Return true if you handle it, otherwise don't. 
Um, and then what type of gesture is it? Is it a, a down event, uh, press, long press? And all I'm doing is logging what happened. Single tap, flame, scroll. Um, And the output you get again is using this more than you want, but at different times you want different type of information. Um, so on the long press, I look at the down, I look at the short press, and the long press. On a fling motion, well, you get the down on show. And you get a bunch of scrolls. And finally, when the person when you leaves the screen, then we get the on flame. And here you can see we're getting um, different uh, velocities for X and Y coordinates. Now, if you don't want to deal with all those events, um, you can subclass on simply just listener and then just implement the methods we're interested in. Um, so here, you know, an example where I subclassed it and just playing the non school. Um, and then it becomes Essentially, like playing listener, um, get by detector, and pass on the playing as a listener, and then in the main activity, I'm still passing touch events to the detector. Right? And if I remember correctly, that's it. Any questions, issues? No? If no one has any questions, we will adjourn early today and we'll see you on Thursday.